This morning we learned about the hardware, and uh, that worked out pretty well. H how many of you, um, why don't we turn this around? Who here wasn't here for, the, for Jason's talk this morning? Anybody? A couple of people? Okay, fair enough. Um, well, hopefully, hopefully you've been able to figure out a few things. If, if you're not, if you haven't put your hardware together already, there's a how-to. Uh, it looks like some of the hardware's together. There's a how-to on the, uh, the CM site and on the USB sticks we passed out. Does anybody not have a USB stick? Anybody? No, everybody does? Okay. So if you look in the introduction um, directory on there, you will find that there's a PDF that explains how to put together the, the kit if uh, you, you haven't done that already. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, we've done kernel modules just now, and we'll have to actually use what we learned in that to do uh, our driver courses tomorrow. All right. And uh, what we're going to concentrate now on is the bootloader. And uh, uh, the bootloader, of course, is very important because, of course, we cannot start without it. And uh, it actually allows us to set up a number of things to do with configurations surrounding things like device tree and other kinds of things, depending on how it's set up. But uh, Merrick here has, uh, has actually worked on the boot, uh, on U-Boot for an awful long time. He works, uh, amongst other things, for uh, Danks Engineering. And uh, uh, he is going to uh, take you through, uh, essentially, the right way of using U-Boot. And uh, off to you, Merrick. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh... So like Bian said, I uh, work on the U-Boot bootloader. Um, this is a quick intro about me. I, I do uh, the maintainer position, one of the maintainers position in U-Boot. So I work on USB, SOGF, PGA, uh, RANESA sports. Uh, that's what I do in U-Boot. I also work on the Linux kernel and uh, open and beat it. And as a hobbyist, uh, I do FPGA stuff. So that's about me. And uh, now let's get to U-Boot. <coughs> so, uh, First of all, um, let's talk about what a bootloader is. So when you turn on the contemporary computer, there has to be some code which gets executed, right? After the CPU uh, completes its power sequencing. And that's usually the bootloader. And its task is to kind of edit the hardware and uh, load the next stage and start the next stage. So that, that's what bootloader does. Now, um, it used to be in such that when the CPU started executing from the reset vector, there was some user replaceable code at that point. That's how it used to be uh, in the times of old. And uh, that was typically U-boot or something else. Didn't matter really. Uh, nowadays, it's uh, getting a little bit more complicated because the CPUs are, the chips are becoming uh, more complex. So what you have nowadays is uh, an SOC, which has a built-in first stage, maybe second stage bootloader, which is responsible for doing like some internal initialization. Usually, it's closed source, and uh, it loads the next stage, which is typically U-boot from some sort of boot media, and starts that. Um, so specifically, U-boot is a bootloader. It can load the next stage, which is uh, Linux kernel, right? But it can also do so much more. Uh, it can behave as a boot monitor. That means instead of just like anything at the hardware and like booting the Linux kernel, it can also drop into a boot monitor shell. And uh, you can operate the hardware like poke registers. Uh, you can operate different buses, um, I2C, SPI, USB, uh, all that sort of stuff. Um, U-Boot has a network support. So you can also exercise network within U-Boot. Um, all this you can do. And this is what we will go through today. I would like to show you how to do this and how to use U-Boot, not just as a bootloader, but as a debug tool as well. Now, uh, here is an example of, of U-Boot from the Pocket Beagle board, which you have in front of you. Uh, this is what you get when you plug it into your USB port. I guess you've probably noticed this already. Um, but I would like to use this opportunity of, of uh, the U-Boot print to give you a couple of, uh, <coughs> or to show you a couple of points in there. Um, so first of all, you see that there is something called U-Boot SPL. Uh, this is the first live sign you get out of U-Boot, and it's trying to boot something from the MMC. So uh, what happens here is actually U-Boot is using multi-stage loading process on this. Uh, board you have in front of you. Uh, this is because um, 
when the boot room is loading the first stage, it did not yet initialize DRAM. So there has to be some sort of small piece of code which initializes DRAM and loads uBoot proper into DRAM and executes it. And that's uh, what the uBoot SPL is for. Uh, it's a stripped down uBoot build from the uBoot sources, which runs in the on chip RAM on the CPU and is responsible for initializing the DRAM, loading uh, uBoot proper from UMC. Uh, or SD card or whatever is on that board, and then executing uBoot. <coughs> so then at that point, uBoot gets started, right? Uh, you have a fairly recent version of uBoot. If you're asking for help in like uBoot mailing list or uBoot IRC, please include this information. Uh, which uBoot version you have, uh, which CPU ideally, which port as well, uh, in the request for help. And you have all that information conveniently available in the uBoot boot log. So you can extract that information from there. Um, what else do we see in the uBoot boot log? Uh, oh yeah, we see that we have quite a lot of DRAM. And ultimately, we reach the uBoot uh, auto boot countdown. Uh, and on this uh, pocket beagle board, uh, you have to interrupt it with space, but that's usually not the case. Um, usually, it's NET, but this is somehow specifically tweaked, so you have to use space. Anyway, uh, if you interrupt the uh, boot countdown, you will reach the, the U-boot shell, at which point you can fiddle with the hardware, whichever way you want. Um, yeah, this is just a small slide about the U-boot SPL, explaining what it is. Uh, the preloader for U-boot, built from the same sources. Um, there's actually also a TPL which you might run into but uh, it's quite unlikely you will meet that. It's uh, for systems which are booting from um, one and flashes. And these are some systems which have like a super specific limitation of having like four kilo preloader. At that point, you have to use the TPL, but hopefully you will never run into that one. So. <clears throat> That is for, that's it for the intro into uBoot, and now let's go through some of the useful commands uh, of the uBoot bootloader. Well, echo commands, uh, this is something which, yeah. Uh, sorry to interrupt, but what are the options available on the pocket beagle? So if uBoot, the question is, uh, if uBoot is deleted, uh, what can you do with the pocket beagle? Uh, well, basically, just write a new SD card image completely, which you can get from the, um, Beagleboard.org website. Just write it to the SD card, plug it into the board, and it will be back in working order. So this board is booting from an SD card, and uh, if you just damage the content of the SD card, just rewrite it with uh, pristine, um, um, pristine image of the SD card, and it should be okay. So it's really difficult to damage this board. And if you need any help, um, just uh, let us know after this talk. Uh, we can kind of help you set it up again. Yeah, OK. Um, and by the way, it's not in the slides. <coughs> it's, it's not there, but uh, thanks for the question. Uh, yeah, so I would like to go through uh, the useful uBoot commands, which uh, you will likely use in, in uBoot hacking daily. Uh, echo command, if you want to print something, whatever, just use echo command. It behaves exactly the same way as, as in uh, your standard uh, born shell. Just echo whatever strings, strings, strings. It will be printed, just like you see in here. Uh, it doesn't interpret any special characters. Uh, the thing about the, the uh, C to suppress new line, uh, yeah, there is just this one small uh, quirk, which is there. Um, the other command which is really useful is help command. Um, so this, this actually has uh, two modes of operation. One of them is just run help. It will print all the supported commands in, in this build of uBoot which you have, uh, which is useful if you get like a board which you have no idea about. You can just type help and see what the uBoot uh, is built with, what does it support. Um, the other thing is, if you are like a seasoned uBoot developer and you're just thinking, okay, so now I want to use USB, but I don't remember the order of, of uh, 
the arguments for a specific USB command. You can use help space uh, command and it will give you details about that command. So like help USB will give you this stuff uh, which uh, says that if you use USB start, it will start the USB bus uh, and you can do all this sort of other stuff with the U-boot USB. <coughs> um, so this is how you can get uh, detailed help from um, the U-boot uh, shell directly, even if you don't have any internet access or anything. Now, if you want to get further help, uh, you can take a look into the U-boot documentation uh, in the U-boot sources. So there is a doc directory with a lot of readmes, um, which contain detailed information about the U-boot stuff. And also, in case you're looking for more of an online help, uh, you can join the U-boot IRC. Uh, this one on Freenode, hash U-boot. Uh, now, <clears throat> like I mentioned before, um, if you're asking for help on the U-boot IRC, please include the U-boot version, include the CPU, include the board name, uh, because this is what happens <coughs> quite often that someone comes to the U-boot IRC, asks a question, and then the next question is, well, which version of U-boot and which CPU and which board it is. So it's really a good idea to include that information up front. Um, it's also a good idea to wait a couple of hours because the U-boot developers may just be asleep or something. I mean, we're in all different time zones and uh, it's probably just a good idea to wait a little, have some patience. Um, finally, um, if you don't get any help on the IRC or in the documentation, you can use the U-boot mailing list. So just send an email to the mailing list and it's gonna be great. Okay, um, now, uh, another useful command is bidinfo. Uh, in case you receive a board which you have no idea about or you're trying to uh, get information about memory layout from U-Boot, uh, BD Info gives you all that information. Uh, what that means is uh, board info, and the important stuff in there is, uh, yeah, memory layout. So uh, in the list from the board info, the, the important part is DRAM mapping. So U-Boot is using just uh, physical memory addresses. There is no virtual memory anything. All the memory addresses are mapped one to one. So that's not a problem. Um, and if you want any sort of working DRAM memory into which you want to load like files or you want to load, you, you want some sort of scratch memory or whatever, um, you can just run BD info and look at the um, DRAM mapping. So this, this memory is something you can use right away. Uh, there's one sort of detail uh, regarding to that is that U-Boot itself relocates at the end of the DRAM. So uh, you should not use the last couple of megabytes of DRAM because otherwise you will just corrupt the U-Boot. Okay, so when, when you start the system, the U-Boot kind of copies itself at the end of the RAM and that's where it resides. Um, you can figure out where it is residing by this uh, relocation address here. So this is the memory address to at which uh, the U-boot binary is starting in DRAM. Now, if you corrupt that uh, memory, well, your system is likely to hang or crash or whatever, but it's not really that much of an issue. I mean, you don't have to be worried like, uh, oh, if I poke that memory address, everything will be done for and it's the over of my board. Uh, that's not gonna happen. It's just in RAM, so if you just power cycle your board, you will just copy itself to that address again and you can just do your stuff again. Um, yeah, but if you want to avoid any problems, just don't poke that memory area. It's gonna be okay. Um, there is another thing in that it's not just U-Boot sitting at the end of the DRAM. There is uh, also like malloc area below U-Boot, which you probably also shouldn't tamper with. Um, but if you avoid like the last 16 megabytes or so, then it should be okay. Uh, there are a couple of other things in here. Uh, if you have network enabled, you will see the current port IP address, the baud rate of the serial port, which you use uh, for the console and so on in the BD info. So it's a really useful command. Um, yeah, but, uh, well, let's move on from uh, 
checking the boards and plus do something useful. That means uh, accessing memory and then moving further. Uh, for accessing memory, we have uh, memory w command for memory write and uh, md for memory dump uh, for reading the memory. Um, these commands are used both to access DRAM as well as registers, so uh, as well as I.O. Um, and they're quite flexible in that uh, they also support a different width of memory access, uh, which is useful if you have like a hardware which is not exactly amazing and needs some sort of specific memory access proper, uh, properties. That is like, if you have hardware which only works if you do like 16-bit access, you can still use these commands in U-boot to operate that hardware using the uh, suffixes. That is uh, md.w and, uh, and w.w will do 16-bit uh, access to that uh, memory address which is specified. Uh, here's an example of, of those suffixes down here. Uh, what this does is, uh, right, this is a standard 32-bit memory access to this address. It just writes to this address this sort of value. Um, it's the, uh, both of the MW and MD actually default to 32-bit access, even on 64-bit platforms. Um, <clears throat> so here's an example of using the suffixes. Uh, this is memory dump. It will do 32-bit uh, memory read of this address, and it will read eight elements. This is how the output will look like. Uh, since we broke this address first, we see it in the dump here. Uh, if we want to use 16-bit accesses, we use the MDW. So you can see it's also here in the output, uh, md.b, and so on. Um, there's another trick to this is in that if you're like dumping memory uh, and uh, you do like md.b here and press enter again, in the U-boot shell it will read the subsequent bytes of memory. So if you're like analyzing some sort of memory and like doing md.b whatever, you can keep hitting enter and it will keep reading further uh, the the memory content. What else do we have here? Yeah, that's pretty much it for accessing memory. Here is an example of accessing the uh, LEDs on the pocket beagle. Uh, so what I do here is uh, toggling LEDs just by poking the GPIO controller registers. That's one. Um, there is uh, quite a few extras in here, but uh, this is the base address of the GPIO controller, one of them on the Pocket Beagle. So I just read um, four long words out of it. And specifically, the address 34 is the I.O. register, and the address 3C is the uh, GPIO output value register. So what I do here is I set the uh, I.O. register first as uh, most of them inputs but some of them outputs in here um, and then I set the value of that register to something and if you try it actually on the on the pocket beagle you will see that the blue LEDs on that will uh, toggle. So this is how you can access registers on, on your board for example. Um, yeah that's pretty much it. Um, so we have a, a couple of other memory access commands. Uh, memory modify is just an interactive uh, command which allows you to modify memory. Um, it has exactly the same constraints as the memory w and uh, memory dump in that, except uh, uh, you just specify uh, memory modify and then address. And uh, what it will do is it will read the value at that address printed just like you see in here. So I, again, pointed it to that uh, GPIO register. So it will read out all those F from the address 34. And if I specify different value here, it will write that different value into the location. Um, if I don't specify anything, it will skip the address. And if I specify, again, some sort of value, it will write it into the address. So this is what I can use memory modify for to interactively 
at just a memory address. Uh, another thing to operate memory is uh, copy command. So CP, this allows me to copy memory from one place to the other. It's the same thing as uh, memcpi. Uh, so you specify amount of memory you want to copy. Uh, sorry, you, you specify um, where you want to copy from, where you want to copy to, and the amount of memory you want to copy. Uh, the amount of memory is not in bytes, but it's in units. That means if I use just uh, CP, it's in long words. So this, this command here will copy eight long words. Uh, if I were to use uh, cp.b, it would be copying bytes, uh, for example. Now, uh, a useful command is cmp. It allows you to compare memory. Uh, this is especially useful if you're debugging something uh, like, let's say, an SPI flash driver. So you do like two reads from the same SPI flash into memory into different places. And then you can use CMP to compare if those two reads actually return the same data. Um, if those reads did return the same data, it will just say, okay, uh, yeah, total of uh, whatever amount of data is the same. Uh, in this example, I just like prepared my own memory content and then copied it so that they have to be the same, right? Uh, but if the data are not the same, like in this example where I copied nine units of data, but uh, only eight of them are the same, it will tell me that, yeah, data at some address are no longer the same, and it will give me this information what's changed. Okay. <clears throat> so do you have any questions regarding the uh, memory access in UBU? Yeah. Well, so the thing, the question is uh, that you can get to the UBU shell during the boot time, but can you after, uh, can you get there after boot time, right? Uh, no. So when you boot Linux, then you boot is done; it just disappears. So you cannot re-enter it at that point. You only ha can enter the UBU shell before it starts the next stage. Uh, so how can you use it for debugging drivers? Well, you use it for debugging hardware mostly. So like you start the U-boot, drop into the U-boot shell, and then you can start like accessing register, accessing different buses, and so on. That, that's the idea. So you don't have to start Linux kernel at all. You just, uh, if you get a board out of factory, which is in state of kind uh, not really tested, and if you can get U-boot booting on that, then you can start poking around. Yeah, there was another question. Yeah, and then there's a third one. Yeah, go ahead. Right, so the question is, what is the reference for the memory addresses and the IOs and so on? So you have to find it in the CPU data sheet. Uh, in this case, it's going to be the uh, AM3358, I believe, CPU. And you just have to read the data sheet and take a look at, yeah, OK, this is GPIO controller at this address. There will be a chapter in there in that PDF at the beginning which says um, memory map or something like that. Uh, it is really specific to each CPU which you use. Yeah. Uh, well, if you're writing a kernel driver, um, Linux will actually remap those addresses. So there will be this remapping between physical and virtual in Linux. And Linux is working with the virtual addresses. Uboot is not. In Uboot, you just use directly those physical addresses. Or, well, in some of the more contemporary systems, it could be that the MMU, the, the memory management unit, is actually enabled. But in Uboot, we try to have like one-to-one -one mapping. So when you look into the data sheet, you can access those registers directly using the memory access command without doing any sort of mental calculation of like remapping addresses or anything. Yeah, if, if you want to do it in Linux, then you have to, uh, in the driver, remap the addresses first. That's right. Okay. In Ubuntu, you don't have to. Uh, yeah. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, pretty much. Uh, so what happens is that the the boot ROM actually loads the SPL from the SD card into the on chip memory. Then that's what it executes the the SPL that initializes the VRAM, and yet it again loads the U boot proper from the SD card somewhere in the middle of the VRAM, and then U boot executes for a while until it initializes the hardware to a certain state and then relocates itself to the end of the DRAM. So there is a bit of a copying, yeah. Oh, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good question. That, this is actually documented in the, on the UBIT website in the doubt how to do that. So, um, yeah, you point uh, GDB, well, well you use the U-boot ELF binary in the GDB, and for a while you can debug it until the relocation point, at which point you use some sort of specific GDB incantation which says, U-boot now moved by a little bit. And like, add this value to your symbol address as an offset. There is something specific in GDB like that. And if you look at the U-boot website, you will be able to find exactly that incantation in there. What was that? Uh, any other questions? Okay, uh, so let's move on. Let's move on to the Ubud shell. Um, so uh, Ubud actually has two different shells. <laughs> it can happen that if you use a really old Ubud, you will run into the old, old Ubud shell, and it's super incapable and super annoying to use. So I hope this will never happen to you. And on the Pocket Beagle you have right now, it, there is the, the new U-boot shell, the, the hash shell, and it's actually imported from Busybox, so it's mostly a bone compatible shell right now in U-boot. <coughs> um, it can do a lot of things. It, it has a standard shell environment, so uh, this is something I'll talk about right now. Uh, it has conditional expressions, it has scripting support, so it can uh, make your life uh, significantly easier. Um, so the U-boot environment is a key value storage, just like you know the, the uh, shell environment on your laptop and your bash. It's quite similar to that, um, except that uh, with U-boot being a bootloader, um, the environment is, instead of stored on the file system, it's stored, uh, well, in multiple places. First of all, there's a built-in environment in U-boot, which is the default environment but uh, usually just the platforms are configured in such a way that there is another environment storage which is user modifiable. Uh, but anyway, during the uh, U-boot startup, um, U-boot checks whether this, uh, other U -boot whether this other environment partition is populated with any sort of environment content, and if it is, this overrides the default environment built into the U-boot binary. Um, so this is so that the uh, uh, user can adjust his uh, U-boot environment at runtime. Now, in any case, u -boot generates an uh, environment in the RAM which is populated with either of these. So that whenever you are accessing U-boot environment um, in the U-boot shell, uh, you are not modifying whatever is stored in your flash. So you can kind of experiment with the U-boot environment um, and you will not damage it until you use specific commands to make it permanent. And even then you can reset the U-boot environment so there is uh, nothing to be worried about. Now, uh, if you want to print the U-boot environment, we have a printf command for that or uh, and print in modern uh, versions of U-boot, although uh, I'll be using the old names because this is something you are likely uh, to run into. Uh, you see, recently uh, we consolidated the U-boot environment under the env command, but uh, since people are used to uh, legacy command names still, and they've, they have been in U-boot forever, um, we still have the legacy aliases, that is. Um, the env command is what you're supposed to use, but uh, there will still be uh, commands like printenv and uh, save and so on. Uh, so um, the printenv or env print command prints the complete U-boot environment. You can also specify just a single variable like 
uh, if I do like end print in here, I, I will get a really long list on the board. Uh, but uh, I'll pick this specific variable arc, for example, and I can do like end print arc, which will just print this single variable. Uh, I can also access the environment variables with as a, as a regular variable, so I can do like echo dollar arc, and will print arm. Right. This is important because then you can use like environment variables in your uboot command line and scripts. Um, if you want to tweak the uboot environment, you can use uh, setenv. Um, there we go. Or and set. It's uh, L th their aliases, so it doesn't really matter. So you can do like setenv uh, foo bar and then print the environment uh, variable foo. It will be bar. It's that easy. Um, you can also do it interactively with env ask. So if you want to ask for a value of variable this one, the groups, uh, and have you boot print like this question, um, you can use the env ask. It will ask the user, well, set variable two. This is the, this question here. Uh, the user will type in some sort of input and it will be set to the groups variable. So then when you do like end print groups, it will be set to the user input. Uh, finally, if you have some sort of like long environment uh, variables or some sort of environment scripts and you don't want to like do set that, that script and then type everything in again, you can use uh, env edit or edit env uh, command. It will just give you uh, <coughs> um, a prompt with uh, which contains the value of the variable here, for example, the crooks in this case. Uh, you can edit it on a single line and then just press enter, which will set uh, the new value of that uh, crooks environment variable. Finally, if you want to make the changes to your environment permanent, uh, you can use the save and command, and this will actually take the in RAM your environment and commit it to the environment storage. So uh, after you run this, if you re even if you reset the board, the content of the U-boot environment will be made persistent. Now, uh, you can also have uh, scripts in the U-boot environment. So you can set the environment variable with some sort of U-boot commands and uh, then apply the run commands to it and execute them. So in this, this case, I'm setting uh, the foo variable to echo hello. If I then use the run command, it will execute the, the content of the Ubud script. Um, I can also use the semicolon to have uh, multiple commands in the in the single script. Uh, the return value of the first element here will be ignored, just like the semicolon on the on the Linux shell. And uh, if I run it, it will print both hello and world. So uh, this is how the scripting works in yeah. Ubud. Now, uh, if you want to access variables within the Ubud environment, uh, this can be a little tricky because of the expansion order. So uh, if you do like, uh, yeah, here for example, uh, set a variable to something like echo dollar through, it will be immediately expanded. So if, then, if I then run this script, it will print bar because I set foo to bar in here, and then I did uh, set of crooks to echo foo, so at this point it was expanded, the, the foo variable. Uh, to prevent this, if you want to have like a script which contains an environment uh, variable access, you either can escape the dollar, or you can use the single quote in the script, this will prevent the expansion. Uh, this is some this is some problem which people do tend to run into quite often and ask about quite often on the uh, keyboard I have seen. Um, now, speaking of variables, there are a couple of special variables in Ubud which have uh, side effects. Uh, there are a few of them in here. Uh, there is a version variable. Um, if you have multiple different uh, input or output devices in Ubud, this is also supported. Then you can select to uh, which device you want to output your content, or from which device you want to read the uh, standard input using uh, these three variables. And they have immediate effects. So if you say like 
okay, set on fastd out uh, display, then the output of the input console will immediately be rerouted to display. Um, load address is the default load address to which eboot is loading uh, files. If you use like file load commands, I'll get to that in a bit. Um, so then they get loaded to this address. Um, the same eboot port will have this address sitting somewhere in the RAM. And you can kind of depend on that being set to a same value and use it in your scripts, the uh, load address. Now, if you load a file, um, all these commands which do file loading will set file size variable. So if you load the file from somewhere, then in your script, you can use the file size variable to uh, use the, the size of the file for whatever purposes you need. Usually it's like, if you want to load a file from network and store it, let's see, in your flash or something, then you can use the file size command. You just like download the file and then in the script you use some sort of uboot command which like uses the load address and file size to write it into the flash. Um, what else do we have here? Uh, boot args are the boot arguments which are passed to the Linux kernel when you start Linux kernel from uboot. Um, boot command is the default uh, script which is executed when the auto boot countdown in, in uboot counts to zero. So this is usually something which uh, loads the Linux kernel into RAM and then boots it. Uh, what do we have here? Uh, yeah, the pre-boot script is convenient in that this is a script which is executed before the auto boot countdown happens. And then there are a couple of uh, IP address, uh, net mask, server IP variables which are used for uh, configuring the network in your boot. Um, finally, there is uh, one more command which, uh, yeah, is there a question? So there's very few instructions about the quality. What's that? Yeah. So it, uh, the question is who sets up those variables? So uh, <clears throat> some of them are automatic, like uh, where is automatic? These have uh, same default uh, selected by the, the person who did uh, the board porting. Um, yeah, load address also has to have a safe default. It's done by the person who did the uboot implementation, uh, uboot port implementation. Uh, file size is automatic. So when you load something, uh, uboot will set that variable. Um, boot args, again, this is up to the one who did the board port. Um, boot command also, pre-boot may not or may not be set. That again depends on who did the board port. Um, IP address, net mask, uh, these ones are not set at all. Uh, it's up to you if you want to use network to configure the network correctly. Um, ETH address, uh, this should be set by the board vendor and it should be unique per each board because this is the MAC address of the board. You can override it by the way. So does that answer your question? Yeah, pretty much they are responsible for configuring most of these directly, yeah. Yeah, okay, uh, so there is uh, one more command to, for operating the environment, which I would like to show you. It's uh, setexper, and this is not enabled in some of the uboot ports which I saw, but uh, this is like a, the Swiss Army knife for operating the uboot environment. Uh, it allows you to do multiple things. One of them is loading uh, content in memory into uboot environment variables. The other thing is it allows you to do mathematical expressions on uboot environment variables. Uh, that means addition, subtraction, and so on. It also allows you to do uh, bitwise operations, uh, both on the uboot environment variables as well as uh, direct uh, memory addresses. And uh, if your uboot is configured in like the full configuration, it also supports uh, regexes on uboot environment variables. So you can do like uh, have uboot environment variable perform a substitution on that, including back references and so on. Uh, so you can do that with set expert. That's uh, the uh, the tool to use here. And uh, what do we have here? Okay, yeah. So here's an example of the set expert loading uh, 
variable foo with content of memory at location this, uh, which I conveniently dumped in here, so I did read this, this memory location. If I perform the setExpr on it with this asterisk here, it will allow me to load content of, of this memory location into the variable foo, and if I then print it, you see that the foo contains uh, the value which was at that address. It's really just like reading uh, memory content into the variable. Uh, what else do we have here? Oh yeah, I can do addition. So I'm setting a variable bass to uh, foo plus bar. Uh, foo is one, bar is two, uh, then the result is three, right? And uh, this is an example of doing uh, substitution. So what do we do here? Um, <clears throat> I'm setting variable foo to, okay. Yeah, replace, uh, in this string, I'm replacing any occurrences of AB plus, which is like a regular expression here, with X and setting it into the variable foo. And the result is then AXCC, because it replaced uh, A and all the Bs with X, right? So this is what you can do with the set expert, which is, in my opinion, pretty cool. Um, you which also supports conditional expressions. Uh, we have a true-false command, which you know from shell again. Uh, they return uh, either zero for true or non-zero for false. They are setting the return value, so then uh, you can use them in, for example, the if statement, which you would, uh, shell also implements. Um, so you can do like if command, then some sort of action, else some sort of other action, conditional expression standard stuff. Uh, there is even the uh, shortened variant of conditional expressions with the or, or, and, and, and. Uh, one thing which UBoot does not implement is the negation of uh, the return value in the if condition. That means you cannot do like if not some sort of command then do something. This is not supported. Um, but you can kind of work it around by doing something like if command then true else do whatever you want something. So this is kind of just sort of detail. Uh, here's an example of you, how you use uh, conditional expressions in the UBoot shell. It's again similar to born shell. So in this example, um, I'm just using the true command to echo hello and yeah, it will echo hello. Um, if I use false command with the shorthand expression, then this always returns uh, non-zero value, again, the echo false will be echoed in here. I can also use this stuff in UBoot script, so it's a foo. If I run the script, it will be true because, yeah, true evaluates to uh, true. Um, yeah, oh, there should be echo in here. So yeah, there's, there's a bug in the slides, there should be an echo in there. Um, UBoot also has a test command. Um, again, pretty much the same thing you have in born shell. Uh, so you can test variables. In this case, I'm setting i variable to four. Uh, if i is less than five, well, which it is, it will return zero. If it is more than five, it will return one, the test command. And then you can also use like if test uh, whatever, then do some sort of condition. So uh, standard test command, as, as you know it from born shell, is also available in UBoot. Um, Oh yeah, we also support uh, loops. So for loop, for iterating over a list of elements is also supported. In this case, I'm iterating, iterating over A, B, C, D, um, and then I echo the variable for the loop in here, and it will print A, B, C, D. Yeah, so that's, that's the for loop. Uh, while loop is also supported, uh, in this case, uh, I'm using the, the true in the condition, which will run indefinitely, but um, if you ever happen to, some, to do something in the UBoot shell which will run indefinitely, you can press Control c which will break the execution, which is what I did in here. I just hit Control c to stop the, the loop. Um, yeah, so there are a couple of other commands which I want to talk about, the uh, GPIO command for accessing uh, GPIOs, but uh, do you have any questions regarding the uh, control statements in, in U-Boot? 
Um, no questions, good. <coughs> so yeah, there is a GPIO command also in U-Boot to operate the general purpose I.O. on your, on your systems. Um, you can use GPIO input to read the value of a GPIO pin. Uh, the upside of that is that it also sets a return value to the value of the GPIO pin so you can use it in a conditional. Like you can do like if GPIO input something, then do some action. And this is for example useful if you're sampling like a button or something which is connected to GPIO, then you can like do the if GPIO input and so on. <coughs> well, it also supports setting the GPIO and clearing the GPIO using the GPIO set clear command. Uh, so yeah, you can do that. And again, these examples here are compatible with the pocket beagle board, so uh, you can try it out. Uh, GPIO 45 is actually the user button on the, on the bacon bitscape. And if you use this example here, you will be able to sample that user command, the user button on that board. Uh, GPIO 53 on that cape is, I believe, one of the LEDs, one of the blue LEDs. So, oh yeah, that's, that's one of the blue LEDs on the board. So if, if you actually try this command on the board you have, you will be able to toggle an LED. So you can try that out. Uh, another useful command, which is kind of ad hoc in here, is I squared C. This allows you to access I squared C buses. Uh, on the board you have, there are three of them. Uh, you can select which bus you want to operate using the I squared C def command, which is confusing. Because we also have I squared C bus command, which just lists the bus. And if you specify like I squared C bus and then bus number, it will ignore that bus number silently. So be careful about that. I squared C def is actually the command which allows you to select which I squared C bus you want to access. Yeah, <coughs> that's, uh, that's a bit of a quirk there. Um, you can use I squared C MD to uh, read registers uh, of an I squared C device. Uh, you can use I squared C memory, uh, memory write, the MV command to uh, write registers. Um, you can use I squared C probe to actually probe what devices are on the bus but uh, it can confuse some old I squared C devices, so use with care. I squared C is not a bus which you can throw. <clears throat> I mean, it mostly works most of the time, but it is, I squared C is not designed to be a discoverable bus. Um, finally, we have I squared C speed command, which allows you to set I squared C bus speed, so in case you need to run the I squared C a little slower, for example, during debugging, you can use I squared C speed. Okay. Um, so these are kind of ad hoc hardware access commands. Um, now finally, loading from all sorts of places and U-Boot is done uh, using the load commands. Um, U-Boot supports a lot of different block devices, uh, both raw and uh, with a file system. Um, so these ones uh, up here allow you to operate uh, Buses like SDMMC with the MMC command, uh, USB with the USB command, SATA with the SATA command. If you have raw NAND that is not managed NAND, you can use the NAND command. And this really allows you to access the, the raw device, uh, print the partition tables, uh, read raw blocks, and so on. But you can also access file systems uh, using the LS and load commands for uh, listing the file system and uh, loading files from it. It could be that on old versions of U-Boot you will not have these generic ls and load commands, but you will have like <coughs> uh, specific commands per file system that is like xload, xls, fatls, uh, fatload. It could happen. Uh, but on modern U-Boot ports you will just have these ls and load commands which are like automatically detecting the file system type. So, um, yeah, uh, except for minor, yeah, I'll get to you in a bit. Uh, I just want to finish this one. Uh, except for minor detail, the UB command is not going anywhere. This is uh, for operating the UB file system. Yeah. No, no, no. I mean uh, load. I mean detecting generic load. Yeah, detecting which file system is there and then using the right code for that. Yeah. Um, that's what I mean. Okay, here's an example of, of loading files from uh, SDMMC. Again, it's compatible with the Pocket Beagle. 
So what I do here is I first rescan the MMC. You should do that. Uh, it detects which card is connected on the bus because this is not done automatically in the background. You is pulling everything, so you have to do that manually. Um, just for completeness, I'm printing the partitions on the MMC cards. Okay, I see I have one partition there, which is type 83, which is uh, Linux X file system. Um, I can list the <coughs> MMC card. Now what this means here is that I want to use MMC card zero partition one. So this is the specific format of, of the ls command. And then I can load from MMC again zero partition one to load address, which I'm depending is set to the same value, this variable, the idtxt uh, file, which I know is on that MMC card. And it will be loaded, and then I can dump it. And I can dump it uh, as byte access, and I know it is loaded to a uh, same load address, and I know I want to read the whole file, so I'm just using uh, file size as a size argument of the MD. So that's a demo how you can load a file from MMC. <coughs> uh, you would also allow you to load stuff from network, but we cannot test that here. But I just want to give you an, an idea how that works. So you would have a network stack. Uh, it's uh, UDP only, though. So uh, there is no support for TCP, but that's not that much of a limiting problem. Uh, you can uh, do what? Let's see. Uh, use TFTP, because that's UDP. Uh, you can use NFS over UDP for loading files. Um, you can use everything which is uh, using ICMP that is ping. Um, you can use DHCP and yeah, that's, that's pretty much all there is. Plus some legacy stuff, but uh, these are the interesting parts. So the way this works is you optionally have to set up the MAC address in case your vendor didn't set it into ETH address. This is the MAC address of your Ethernet interface. Um, then you have to set up IP address NAT mask server IP, which is the uh, link partner IP address. And then you can do stuff like ping the, the, the remote server, TFTP uh, file from the remote server. Um, <clears throat> and actually, you can use even the DHCP command, which will automatically query the network for IP address first. So then you do not have to actually set up the IP address NAT mask. You can then use the DHCP as well. So that's it for network loading, but uh, there's also uh, support for loading over serial port, uh, which is the X modem, A modem, um, or Kermit uh, loading support that's also in Uboot. And if everything else fails, you can still use this. And for that, you have the, uh, for example, the load epsilon command here, um, which will allow you to uh, load file over uh, emodem. <coughs> now, in this case, if you run the load, you will be waiting for you to actually initiate an emodem transmission. So in Minicom, that is the send file sort of thing where you select emodem, then the file, and will upload it on the other side. Obviously, it's going to be slow, this one. But it's kind of last resort. If everything else fails, you can also load over the serial port. Um, and yeah, finally, the booting the Linux kernel. I mean, this is what the bootloader should be doing, right? I mean, so. <coughs> that's, the, that's the main task. Uh, except that uh, there are, this is still kind of complicated because uh, over the time, there have been a couple of Linux kernel image formats. Uh, so it's not like as trivial as just dumping in some sort of kernel file and booting it. Um, so if you're using like uh, Linux on ARM, you will probably run into three different image formats. Uh, one of them is ZImage, which is like the raw Linux kernel image with a preloader or decompressor. And this is something which you just put into the RAM. Uh, set up a couple of registers, just jump, jump to it, and the Linux kernel will start booting, right? Optionally, you may need to specify device tree, which you pass to the Linux kernel through registers, but uh, that's, that's pretty much it. There is no protection against bit rot. Um, <clears throat> and this is obviously not sitting well with people doing uh, embedded Linux. So at some point, uh, what emerged is uImage, which is like uBoot image. And this has been legacy since forever. But people still keep using it for some reason, and we cannot get rid of it, unfortunately. Uh, it was supposed to solve the problem of 
there is no checksum on the Linux kernel image. And if you deliver that in field, well, eventually there will be some data corruption and we will not be able to detect it. So the U image has CRC32, which is like nothing, right? Nowadays, it's just doesn't make sense. Um, but that's what it is and it's, it's stuck with us and it's not going away. Um, it's just like a wrap around the Linux kernel file. It has a couple of metadata in there, like where to put the, the file and uh, where to jump when you start that file and what architecture it is. But that's pretty much what the UMH is. It doesn't scale in any way. Uh, so what uh, the U-Boot crowd came up with like 10 years ago or something like that is uh, image format based on the device tree. And what that is about is you describe um, which blobs you want to include in the kernel, or well, not even kernel, it's like multi-component image, uh, where they should go, what checksum algorithm should be used for each of those blobs. Uh, and then you use like MK image, which is a tool from Uboot to bundle all those blobs together, that is Linux, device tree, whatever other stuff it generates one single file with like configurable everything. That's basically what the fit image is. Uh, I would like to show you the fit image source file, so I'll, I'll do that in a bit. But uh, first of all, since we are using the pocket eagle, I would like to show you how to boot the uh, Linux kernel Z image, just for the simplicity's sake. So to boot the Z image, you use the boot Z command. Uh, if you ever get the uh, ARM64 machine, you may use the boot I command instead. The arguments are the same, it's just for booting the ARM64 image. Uh, for booting any other image type, you use boot M command. You just specify the image type. That's pretty much it. Um, the boot that command takes three arguments. Uh, first, of, first one is the address of the kernel, optionally in the MFS, and then optionally device tree. And here's an example of loading the kernel image, the device tree, um, and booting it on the pocket view actually. So what I do here is first I need to set the boot arguments for uh, the Linux kernel. I need to tell it where the serial console is supposed to point to. Uh, then I load the uh, VM Linux, which is that is the set image actually. It's just uh, named differently. I load it into RAM. I load device tree into RAM again from MMC. So this is the device tree for the Pocket Beagle, and then I use boot set to started the Linux kernel, which I loaded to 82 something something here. Um, I use dash because I do not have any in RAMFS, and then I provide the device tree address in the RAM again, and the kernel will start booting. Now, what's that? Yeah, uh, yeah, I, yeah, right, so let's go back here. So the boot set command takes uh, up to three arguments, right? The first one is the address of the Linux kernel. Um, the, the second one is the address of the Inidram FS. And the third one is the address of the device tree, right? So since I do not have any Inidram FS, because I just don't have, I, I just want to boot from the MMC directly. And the kernel will then be kind of booting from the MMC directly. It will not start any Inidram FS. I just say, okay, I don't have any, so I use the dash. This is a special marker which says, this is not present. Uh, if I was actually booting without uh, device tree, I would be able to just say boot z um, this address. And I would be able to omit all these parameters. But if I want to say I'm booting with the kernel without Inetram FS, but with device tree, I have to use the dash. So there could be a third address instead of the dash. Yeah, uh, does that answer the question? Okay, good. Uh, yeah, so uh, speaking of device tree, if you want to modify device tree and experiment with it, you can also do that um, using the FDT command in UBoot. So what you can do is load the device tree into RAM <coughs> and then use FDT adder command to point you to that device tree blob and then you can modify that device tree blob in RAM that is like printed content, set its nodes, um, 
FDT resize will be useful because if you want to add nodes into the device tree in RAM, you have to run the FDT resize first to add some sort of space so that you can operate with that blob. Um, here is an example. Is this actually readable? Not quite sure. Uh, the thing is, I just load the device tree the same way I did on the previous slide into RAM, then use like FDT adder to tell the UBoot where the device tree blob is sitting. I use the FDT resize command to allow UBoot to add stuff into that device tree. And yeah, well, then I'm printing it here. I'm setting something in the chosen node of the device tree. If I print it again, I see that it's been added to the chosen node. And if I then boot the Linux kernel, the Linux kernel will also be able to see whatever I added into the device tree through the proc device tree. This way I can like modify the device tree within uBoot before I pass it to Linux. So if you want to experiment with your device tree blob and you do not want to rebuild it on your PC, then you can use the FDT command in uBoot. Uh, oh yeah, and here is the fit image example. So <clears throat> this is just like um, to give you an idea what the state of the art uh, Linux kernel image bundling format is. Uh, so this looks uh, pretty much reasonably similar to device tree, right? Uh, so this is the fit image source. Uh, um, the fit image description source. What I do here is we have an image section. We have a section for the kernel, which describes what the kernel is. Uh, includes the Linux kernel set image, which is of type kernel, architecture is ARM, and so on. It tells us where to load it, uh, what the entry point is, what the hash algorithm is. I can select like CRC, um, SHA1, 256, and so on. Uh, the fit image also supports encryption and so on. Um, there's another section for uh, flattened device tree. And ultimately, there's also a configuration section which ties those two together, the Linux kernel and device tree. And you would can parcel that. Uh, once you have this sort of uh, description written, you can generate the uh, Linux fit image with uh, MK image dash uh, F, the uh, fit image source, which is like this sort of content on the previous two slides. And we'll check out this single fit image, which contains like everything which is specified. <coughs> okay. Finally, uh, compiling the UBoot sources. Um, I'm not sure if I should really even go into this here, but um, <clears throat> if you want to tweak the UBoot sources, you can get the UBoot sources at this location. Uh, it's accessible both through uh, Git and HTTP. Uh, once you clone the sources as using Git, uh, just change directory into the sources, uh, export your architecture, which is for the Pocket Beagle, it's going to be ARM, it can be anything else, MIPS, PowerPC, x86. We support a couple of architectures. Uh, you need to export your cross-compile toolchain prefix, which is a cross-compile variable, and then do something like make uh, board name underscore def config and make which will generate the, the UBoot binaries. Right. Uh, and that's pretty much it. And I would like to get to the practical part. Maybe we should have a brief pause before the practical part. Uh, do you have any questions? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so the question is, how does UBoot fit into the UEFI versus BIOS situation? Yeah, that's actually a good question. Uh, huh. UEFI is a specification of a boot interface, I believe. So, <clears throat> on an x86, it is possible to run uBoot on top of BIOS. So you can basically load uBoot somewhere into memory just like you load grub, right? And you can run it on top of UEFI even. So UEFI loads uBoot and executes it. So you have like this multi-stage loading. Now, there is another way you can do this in that uh, on the system, you will start uBoot and uBoot is since recently capable of running UEFI applications. So it implements this UEFI application protocol. And you can, for example, run Grub as an application on top of uBoot, and uBoot is providing you UEFI library services. 
it's not even chain loading. The Grub will be then running as a UEFI application on top of Uboot. And yeah, Uboot will be responsible for loading or starting or bootstrapping or whatever this UEFI application. So Uboot can behave as an FE library. But it can also run on top of FE. <laughs> so, um, it's so confusing. Um, Uh, I, I mean, yeah, you can use UEFI on ARMv whatever, 7, 8, doesn't matter. You would. Ah, uh, right, that, that's true, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, by default they don't. No. Uh, yeah, and it's uh, chip specific. Yeah. And uh, it depends, really. It really depends on the chip, uh, how it is implemented, if the secondary loader is even needed. Usually nowadays it is, because the, the chip has like this limited on chip RAM, which is like tens of kilos, for example, and the code in that on chip RAM has to initialize DRAM in some way, that's why you need a second stage loader, which then starts Uboot. And actually, the SPL is even able to load Linux directly. So this is like a Falcon mode thingy, which allows you to, in the SPL, load Linux directly into RAM and then start it to completely bypass Uboot. <laughs> That depends on how it's implemented. So uh, the Pocket Beagle chip, the OMAP thing, is capable actually of loading uh, the SPL from VFAT file system. And this is an implementation detail of that chip. Or it can load it from raw SDMMC. That's what it can do. There are other chips which can load from X file system, for sure. So it, it, it really is an implementation detail of the chip. What we try to do, at least in Uboot, <coughs> is to unify on the fact that once you are in the Uboot SPL, from there on you can load the next stage from a file system, so it's in kind of so it's kind of civilized, you know, loading from there on. Yeah, sure. I know this this is kind of confusing with the UEFI because you can like have Uboot be the UEFI library as well as have you boot running on top of a UEFI library, so it's like it works yeah. both ways. Yeah. 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 Well, thanks for the question. It, it was a good one. Yeah. <clears throat> on on the BeagleBone, um, I don't know that you have. Do you have save ENV by default? So if you make changes in your U-boot environment and you want to save them, mm -hmm. um, I don't, I think you have to rebuild something in order for that to be turned back on. Uh, yeah, on the BeagleBone it could be that uh, the save env is not enabled. Uh, in some of the builds previously it was not enabled and the build which you have on this board it should be enabled. But can it be, it can be, it can be enabled even though, so they don't have a boot partition like right. some other BSPs like TIs, SDK. Yeah. But it can it can be it can still be enabled. There's a place for that save file to go, so it can either be written to the ext4 partition or somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a question. Um, can you can you repeat that question? Okay. Uh, so um, all right. So I mean, I've I've, I've I've been working with a different BeagleBone product. Right. Um, and for that, I mean, I guess for all the products, there's like a TI SDK and mm -hmm. there's the BeagleBone Debian distribution. Right. The TI SDK has a separate a separate U-boot partition and then right. an ext4 partition. <coughs> I'm sorry, a DOS, a VDOS partition for U-boot yeah. and an ext4. But the BeagleBone has just a single ext4 partition, and then they shove the bootloader into this this no man's land, whatever it's called, raw mode. Yeah, uh, that, that's pretty which is bad. Below, yeah. Which is below the partition. <coughs> so, well, no, I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying uh, when you okay. So, in the case so of the TISDK, <laughs> no, no, I had to set up. Okay, so in the case of the TISDK, they say, you know, in their examples, okay, set up a net boot. 
And so then you have to save all these, these things to yeah. save ENV, and it gets saved mm -hmm. to a binary file which gets written by default to the, to the DOS partition. Mm -hmm. to Possibly. The boot, to the boot partition. Possibly, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, and then my question is, with the, with the Beagle Bone, if you turn that back on so that you can save uBoot environment variables, uh -huh. does, that, does that binary file that saves the environment get written to that region below uh, the no, Linux I, partition? I believe it's written to the X4. So that, that's the configuration for this uh, board you have, is that it's written to the X4. I mean, but if you, if you need to modify <coughs> things and you want to do a net boot instead of a yeah. boot off of us, then you know, it's convenient to save those environment variables yeah. and you might have to turn that back on or otherwise you'll have to retype. Absolutely, know. yeah, and uh, it should be enabled to save and, and it's writing the file to the X4 file system. Okay, so just a point that you're taking. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, one more thing about the environment is that Uboot has support for placing the environment in multiple locations, so it can be configured differently on different Uboot ports. So we support like storing it in different sort of flashes, raw block devices, and so on, and uh, even uh, file systems like VFAT, Ext is also supported. Okay, so. Uh, we have, uh, we've come to the end of the day, I'm afraid. It's, it's just past six o'clock and um, I'm sure everybody has to, to, uh, to get off to supper and that sort of thing. But I just want to th thank uh, Merrick very much for his great talk on U-Boot. I'm uh, really hoping that, that you, uh, you learned a lot and you actually found the right way to use U-Boot. I know I've learned a lot. And um, uh, tomorrow we've got a couple more talks. Uh, we've got, uh, in the morning we're doing a talk on debugging the kernel using GDB remotely. We've got a talk in uh, early afternoon uh, talking about uh, I squared C and the device model. Uh, and then in fact we're going to finish up tomorrow with the SPI driver um, uh, class. And so that we'll actually be writing several drivers uh, tomorrow. So do, do come back and uh, we'll, we'll play a lot more using uh, modules and so on and so forth. But uh, for now we will see you tomorrow. And, uh, uh, thank you for attending today. We've actually managed to give out every single kit, so every one of you has actually come to at least one of the classes today, which is amazing. Thank you very much. If you have any U-Boot questions, um, drop me an email or ask in the mailing list, uh, ask on the IRC, uh, you know. That's a really good point. Um, that's a really good point. We have a G plus group. We also have a, uh, a hash e EAL uh, channel on Freenode. So if, you, uh, if you're on, on IRC at all, in fact, you can ask questions there on the channel, okay?